Well, today I want to talk to you on this thought, winning your battles God's way. Now, we all like to win our battles, whether it's just an athletic competition or whether you're playing a game of tic-tac-toe, we like to win. But normally, we like to win our way. In other words, we think our way is right and everybody else's way is wrong. Well, if you're going to win the battles that are in your life, um, you're going to have to win them God's way. Now, interestingly, in the Bible, there are a lot of metaphors about battle and being at war and being a soldier. Um, in the New Testament, it talks about putting on the whole armor of God. Um, in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, it talks about the armor of God, the armor of light. Um, in uh, the New Testament, it says that we are to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It also talks about spiritual warfare. In the Old Testament, there are all kinds of references to battles, and there are all kinds of recordings of actual battles. Uh, we all know the story of David and Goliath. We all know the story that we're going to read today about the battle of Jericho, where the walls came tumbling down. Uh, we know that the Israelites had a battle or a war to go into the promised land. Now, what does this mean for us? Well, I believe that all of us face battles. We're going to face spiritual battles. The Bible's very clear that you are going to be in a war for your spiritual life. We're going to be in a battle for our mind. The Bible says in Romans that we are to uh, let God transform the way that we think. It's a battle for the way you think. Uh, there's a battle for your marriage. There's a battle for raising your kids. If you don't think that it is a war, uh, that the devil would try to destroy your family and destroy your kids, you're not paying attention. There are all kinds of battles in the Christian life. We're going to face the battle spiritually. We're going to face the battle of temptation. And I could just go on and on. Now, here's the thing. If we're going to win these kinds of battles in our life, we cannot do it in the way that we normally think. Because normally what we think is, if we're going to win a battle, we've got to get tough. Now, there's nothing wrong with being tough, but that's not to, the way to win spiritual battles. We, we think if we're going to win a battle, it's got to be that we get revenge. But God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And in fact, when Jesus was here on earth, he said something so radical, so completely, uh, that was so opposed to what normal thought was. He said, if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. He says that we are to love our enemies. It's completely a different way of winning a war. So we're going to read today uh, the battle of Jericho in the book of Joshua. Let's read beginning in Joshua chapter 6 and verse number 8. And this describes the battle for Jericho. All right, and very interesting how they did it. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. Already a very unusual battle scene. You put the preachers out front. You put the people out front that don't know how to fight. You put the people out front that are not trained in warfare, but they're trained in spiritual warfare, and so they're the ones out front. And these armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard. So they're marching. They got the preachers out front, they're blowing on ram's horns, and he says, don't say a word. Now, that's interesting. Why would he say that? I'm going to explain that to you in a minute of what I believe that means, a principle we can glean from that. 
He wasn't saying don't make noise. They were made, making a lot of noise, and they were marching around the city walls. He said, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day that I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about it once, and they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. We don't know how big the city was, how long of a march around the wall it was, probably a mile, maybe a couple of miles, could have been longer. But they were marching around the city once a day, and they did this for six days. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord, and the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord walked on, and they blew the trumpets continually. And the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned into the camp. And so they did for six days. So six days, they get up, they start blowing their own horn, tooting their own horn. All right, they're blowing. Right, that was funny. You should have laughed at that. I thought that was, go ahead, give me a little, get a little applause. All right. Those of you online, um, I know, just, I'm sorry. All right, so, but the fact is, they were doing this, getting up, blowing the horns, preachers out front, and then on the seventh day, notice what they did. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times, seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. And only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live. Because she hid the messengers whom we sent, but you... Keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord, and they shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown, and as soon... As the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. The wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. I want to just glean four principles from this passage that show us how that we are to win the battles that God brings into our life, the spiritual warfare that we must fight, how we are to do that in a way that pleases God. We're going to win the battle God's way. Here's number one, the first principle. You must fight God's way. Now, can you imagine being the person that would announce to the military, all right, here's our strategy. We're not going to take our guns or our tanks or our airplanes or our ships. We're not going to take our swords or our spears. But what we are going to do is we're going to put the people that have never been trained in the military out front. We're going to put the Levites, the priests, we're going to put the preachers out front. And we are going to blow some horns. Now, you can't say anything. But what we're going to do, now here's the good part of the strategy we're, going, we're not going to go into the city. We're not going to fight. We're going to march it around the city. And then we're going to go back, and we're going to go back and rest and sit by the campfire, make some s'mores. Um, we're, we're just going to go relax. And the next day, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to get up, and for six days, you know what we're going to do? We're going to march around that city, and we're going to blow our horns, and we're going to have not the military out front, But we're going to have the preachers out front. And what we're going to do on the seventh day, oh, here's the good part. We're going to do it seven times. (laughs) Now, i got to be honest with you. 
That may be the dumbest military strategy in the history of military strategies. If you went to West Point, there would not be anybody that would study that battle and say, oh, this was a good strategy. You know why? Because it was not man's way of fighting a battle. There's no general in history that would say, hey, that's the best way to fight a battle. Let's put some preachers out front. Let's blow some horns. Let's march around our enemy and hope they give up. It was crazy, but here's the point. You and I must understand that we cannot fight battles on our own strength, in our own power, and expect to win spiritual battles. It just doesn't work that way. God's ways are different than our ways. I want you to notice two things uh, that inform us how to fight God's way. First of all is the principle of presence. Presence. In verse 8, it says, The seven priests with the ram's horns started marching, notice, in the presence of the Lord. You want to be able to fight the battles for your mind, for your family, against temptation. You want to be able to fight those battles God's way. You got to get into the presence of God. That's what he's saying. It may not be the kind of strategy that you would choose because what you and I would choose would be uh, when someone hurts us, you know what we do? We hurt them back. But that's not God's strategy. God's strategy is that we love our enemies, that we forgive those that have hurt us And when we fight in the presence of God, then God begins to bless us. It's the principle of presence. And then here's the second principle. It's the principle of promise, of promise. And it says, the ark of the Lord's promise followed them. Can I just tell you this? One thing you need to do, you want the presence of God, worship him. We worship in church, we worship online, we worship by listening to good music, but one of the most important ways that we worship is through the Word of God. You want to be able to fight the battle that comes your way? Read the Bible. You say, well, I'm not very good at reading. Well, get you a smartphone and uh, download the Bible app, and you can put in a Bible plan or just maybe uh, choose a book of the Bible, and you can press a button and it'll read it out loud to you. You know what I do every day when I drive into work here at the church building? You know what I do? I put that on, and I listen to it on the way to church. You have time and the ability to be able to get the Word of God in you. It's the principle of presence, and it's the principle of promise. Do you know that if you're going to win the battle, if you're going to stay and win the victory, you got to have the promises of God in your life. You gotta have the word of God, the presence of God, and when you do that, it makes all the difference in the world. We gotta fight God's way. Here's the second principle I want you to see, which is a very unusual principle, but it's a very important principle. Number two is we harness the power of our words. Did you notice what Joshua said to them? They're making all this noise. I don't know how many soldiers they had. It was a lot, tens of thousands, I know in the next story we'll read, and uh, the message next week, they went to the battle of Aya, Aya, I used to say A-I, it's spelled A-I in English, but it's actually, because Hebrew is a, a guttural language, it's Aya, Aya, it almost sounds like something off of Cobra Kai, right? Aya, right? That's the, the battle we're going to fight next week, all right? But I, I want you to see this, that in spite of the fact that they were making all this noise, in spite of the fact that they were blowing horns, he said, don't say a word. Don't say a word. But when I tell you, you better say a word. In fact, you better shout. So here's what I want you to see. When you and I harness the power of our words, it helps us fight our battles God's way. But when I let my tongue be loose, when I say things that I know I should not say, when I speak things that I know I should not speak, when I say, well, that's never going to work, when I begin to speak things like that into the air, you know what I'm doing? I'm not speaking in faith, but I'm speaking in the power of my own experience. And here's what I know. When I begin to live by faith, 
God begins to change my circumstances, right? He begins to help me win the battle. Listen to Proverbs 18, 20, and 21. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. In other words, it matters what you say. The produce of your lips are going to bring satisfaction in your life. They're going to bring success in your life. Or they're going to bring failure in your life. You ever notice that oftentimes as a parent, uh, Kim and I, we have three children. Our children are all grown. They're 32, 30, and 26 years old now. But have you ever noticed that as a parent, a lot of times we'll say stuff that we regret saying? There's power in our words. You ever notice that the more negative things you just kind of speak and put out there, that the more negative things come into your life? By the way, you know that's a biblical principle. It's the, it's the principle of sowing and reaping. You want to reap love? Sow some love. You, you want to reap uh, positivity? Be positive. You want to reap friends? Be friendly. Uh, you want to reap negativity? Just be negative all the time. You want to reap uh, destruction? Be destructive in your words. I promise you, the more destructive you are in your words, the more you're going to destroy your relationships. There's power in our words. And then look at the next verse. He says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. In other words, God is saying this. There's power in the words that you say. Now, once again, I'm not just simply saying name it and claim it. That's not, that's not what I'm teaching at all. Uh, I am saying, though, that there's power in faith. Did you know that throughout Scripture that faith is almost always tied to our words? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be, what? Shall be saved, right? Now, we know that Salvation comes from faith, it, believing and faith, right? And so what God's saying there is, whosoever shall call, in other words, my words produce faith. And I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm going to let others know there is power in faith. There's power in faith-filled words. So what should you speak? You should speak words of faith. Words of faith. You should speak words of forgiveness. Man, that's a hard one, isn't it? The the fact is, if it's not very hard for you to release forgiveness, then you haven't been hurt very much. You haven't been wounded very deeply. But it's the deep wounds that are really, really, really hard to forgive. And I know a lot of times we're like, well, you know what? I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't feel like forgiving that person, so I'm not going to be a hypocrite and I'm not going to say it. Did you know that in Scripture that our feelings or emotions follow our actions? It's not the other way around. In fact, in our culture, you know what they say, what they teach, watch a movie, your actions follow your feelings, right? If you are in love, you're going to be kind to that person. You're going to woo that person. You're going, to, you're going to do everything you can to be nice to that person. But then whenever you start, you're not feeling it anymore. Well, I love her. I'm just not in love with her, which is a big load of bull hockey. All right. So uh, look, the bottom line is our emotions follow our actions. That's biblical love. You want to be loving? Then start doing loving actions. And what will happen, you're going to find this shocking. The more you do loving actions, the more emotionally attached, the more loving you're going, the more love you're going to feel. And did you know that the same principle is true for forgiveness? Of course you don't feel like forgiving a person that's hurt you, especially if they've hurt you deeply. You'd be crazy if you felt like forgiving them. But it's not for them. It's for you. And when I begin to speak those words, you want to know how to forgive? Just say it out loud. I forgive her. I forgive him. You say, well, I don't have, 
I, I just think I'd be a hypocrite. I don't mean it. You start saying it by faith. By the way, did you know that Jesus taught that it might take a few times of practicing that? Do you remember the story when Peter, one of the disciples, came to Jesus and said, how often should we forgive? Till seven times? And I could just see Peter. He's just so proud because the Jewish tradition was three times. Jewish tradition was if someone offends you, you have to forgive them three times, three different times. And then after that, Katie bar the door, it's every man for himself. Now, Peter was being, he was being a good little disciple, and he was just so, I could just see him being so proud of himself because he doubled what the tradition was and added one. He's like, ah, Jesus, boys, y'all come around. Get ready to say something profound here. Jesus is going to brag on me. Um, Jesus, how often should we forgive till seven times? And Jesus said, oh, no, until 70 times seven. I'm sure that just blew his mind. And was Jesus saying that after 490 times, then it's time to start punching somebody? No. He's simply saying, I think there are two principles, two principles, two principles there. Sorry. It's the snow. All right. So there are two principles there. One is that sometimes it's going to take a little time to forgive. You might have to do it more than once. And uh, the other is that we just need to practice a lifestyle of forgiveness. And so what you and I need to learn is that there is power in our words. Speak words of forgiveness. Speak words of favor. The favor of God. Speak blessing over people. I, I was talking to my wife, Kim, recently about this. In my life, God has really begun to work in my life about making sure that I say things that I should say to people before their funeral. Now, I'm not trying to be morbid, but like uh, we were talking about my dad and mom, they're getting uh, on up in age, and I don't know how many more Christmases I have with them, how many more birthdays we get to celebrate with them, but I, I know that I'll be doing my dad's funeral if God gives me the strength and I live longer than he does. Um, and I was, I was thinking about this. What am I going to say about my dad? And man, he's had such influence on my life. Has he been perfect? Of course not. Neither have I, and neither are you as a parent. But I just remember thinking that, you know, all these wonderful things that I'm going to say, and you know what it dawned on me? I'd be a fool not to say those things to him while he's alive. And I remember picking up the phone, and just telling my dad, Dad, I want you to know that I love you, and I want you to know that you've had more influence on my life than any other human being on this planet for good, and that everything that I've accomplished in my life, you get part of the credit because of how you poured into me. And I began to tell him how great of a man that I thought he was and how great uh, God is, greatly God has used him. And he was never a famous pastor. He never pastored a huge church. Uh, he never, you know, was on television or anything like that. But I just began to tell him, speaking words of favor over my father. Can I just tell you this? Can you imagine, I know you can, how much favor that spoke into my dad's life. Now, he mostly has been responsible for speaking those things into my life. But I just determined, you know what? I'm going to speak words of favor when I can. Now, do I do it always? No. I've I got to be honest. Sometimes, um, even on the drive to church this morning, I did not speak words of favor to the person that was in front of me. It may have, and I'm not saying there's any evidence of this, but there, the words may have said, move it, fool! I'm just saying there may have been words like that spoken out of my mouth. So I don't get it right all the time. <laughs> yes. Oh, was it you that I spoke to? All right. So I don't get it right all the time, but here's what I know, that when I can, I'm going to try to speak words of favor 
I believe that our life is better when we do that. So the principle, you got to harness the power of your words. And then the third principle is this. Immerse yourself in the gospel. Now I want to read verse 17 again. It says, The city and everything in it must be totally destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Now I'm going to explain that in just a minute. And only the prostitute Rahab and her household will be spared because she hid our spies. If you're not familiar with the story, they sent spies in, and the military commanders found out that they were coming in to spy out the city. And they were going to try to kill them. And Rahab, who was a prostitute, by the way, that's the way the Bible describes her, Rahab the prostitute. Aren't you glad that we don't get defined by our mistakes, by our sins, by our past, all right? Uh, but she was most likely a madam, all right? Not just a prostitute, she most likely, because she had a house there, most likely scholars believe that she most likely was a madam. And what she did was a great act of courage and a great act of faith because she trusted in the God of Israel. And she hid the spies. Now, this is a beautiful picture of the grace of God. Let me explain, if I can, uh, what it means to be dedicated to destruction. I know some people that are agnostics, that one of the things, one of the real problems they have with the Bible or with God or with the God of the Old Testament is they say that God commanded um, babies to be killed uh, in these cultures. Well, not so fast. Uh, let, let me explain this to you. Uh, first of all, these cultures were very wicked. Um, they sacrificed babies. They literally burned babies alive to the God of Molech. Um, they were extremely uh, deviant in their sexual activity. They were ridden with sexual diseases and completely deviant behavior. In fact, if you and I were alive and there was a culture like this that destroyed babies the way they did, we all, in a unified voice, would say, that culture needs to be stopped. They need to be held responsible. They need to be held accountable. That is wrong. The killing of babies is wrong. Now, on the flip side of that, that doesn't explain God saying, go into the city and kill every man, woman, child, and baby. Well, the idea there of being dedicated to destruction, and I want you to see this, is a picture of the gospel. You say, how in the world is that a picture of the gospel? Well, in case you haven't, you haven't read in Scripture, the Bible says that all of us are born separated from God because of sin. The Bible says all have sinned, and we all fall short of the glory of God. In John chapter 3, where the most famous and most loving verse in all the Bible is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Did you know in the verses following it says that if you don't believe that you're condemned already? You're already condemned, set aside for destruction. What is that destruction? Eternal separation from God. If you die without Christ, if you die without that relationship with God, the Bible says you have been set aside for destruction. In other words, you'll go to hell. And the definition of hell is eternal separation from God. And so this is a picture of the gospel. Every person in this culture was set aside for destruction. Just in the same way, every person born on this planet is born with a sin nature and separated from God. So it's a picture of the gospel. Um, the fact that God spared Rahab in spite of her reputation, in spite of her past, in spite of her deeds, that is a picture of the gospel as well. Because you know what? Every one of us has been set aside for destruction, but every one of us, no matter our past, no matter our sins, we have been given the grace of God if we'll just receive it. So it's a picture of the gospel. Um, but what about the, when it commanded them to kill babies? Well, some scholars believe that this was a euphemism. 
all right? A euphemism is just simply an uh, easier way, uh, a kinder way of saying something. Um, other places talk about driving them out. Now, this is interesting because in uh, their culture, if this was a euphemism, killing every man, woman, boy, and girl, and I'll explain that in just a minute, um, then why would it say in other places in the Old Testament not to kill them all, but to drive them out? Let me just read a few of these verses. Exodus 23, 28. I will send terror ahead of you to drive out. And these are the people that inhabited the land of promise, the promised land. The Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites. Some of the same people that lived in Canaan. Okay? Um, Leviticus 18, 24, and 25. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways. For the people I'm driving out before you have defiled themselves. In other words, they were sinners. They were completely separated from God, just the picture of the gospel, like you and me. Um, it, it, but the entire land has become to Father, and I am punishing the people who live there, and I will cause the land to vomit them out. Now, did the land literally vomit? Well, no, that's a, that's a metaphorical phrase. That's a word play. Uh, so, uh, Numbers 33, 52, you must drive out all the inhabitants of the land, destroy all their stone and metal idols and their places of worship. Now understand this, this is very important. When God commanded that you were to kill every man, woman, boy, and girl, and even every animal, there were times, of course, that these were set aside for destruction. But this, I believe, is very common in ancient Jewish language. Uh, hyperbole, gross exaggeration, was very common in their culture. For example, do you remember when Jesus said to the Pharisees, you guys will strain out a gnat out of your water, but you'll swallow a camel? Well, that's hyperbole, okay? The fact is, they were so careful, they wanted everything to be so clean and so pure, they would, they would strain their water to make sure not even a little gnat was in it, but Jesus said, you'll strain out a nap, but you'll swallow a camel with no thought. Well, he's using hyperbole. They didn't literally swallow a camel. That's physically impossible. Uh, other places where Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's hyperbole. Uh, when Jesus said uh, that some of you harboring unforgiveness in your heart, he's talking about, and judging others. He said, some of you, you want to try to help get the little tiny speck out of your neighbor's eye that you say, well, that person's a sinner. They're doing wrong. Let me get that little speck of sin out of their life. And he said, the whole time, you've got a plank sticking out of your eye, literally a beam, like a six by six, 10 foot long beam. Now, do you get the picture? He's just making a point. That is real exaggeration, hyperbole. Now, in their culture, it was hyperbole when they would dedicate a, a city for destruction to say, kill every man, woman, boy, and girl. And what they're saying is they were going to annihilate, listen closely, their false gods. Because this was a matter of worshiping the God of Israel, not the gods of these lands. So they wanted to completely destroy it. Why? So they would not worship their false gods. And so this hyperbole, in the same way that you and I say, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. I doubt you're going to go eat a horse. First of all, good luck finding a restaurant that serves horse, all right? Um, I have eaten horse in Italy, visited a missionary friend of mine, and uh, they served us horse, did not let everybody know it. And he said, do you want any more? I said, nay. All right, no, I'm kidding. I did actually eat horse. Uh, and it was delicious, all right? So uh, just had a little gluey taste in my mouth afterwards. All right, so uh, anyway, the, the fact is we don't eat horses. We don't eat an entire horse, even if we did. What is that called? That's hyperbole. And so when they suggested that they were to do all that, it is a picture of salvation. These people have been set aside for total destruction, just like you and me, completely separated from God, completely without hope, completely without any hope of life or eternal life. 
But thank God through the grace of God and the work of God and the work of Jesus on the cross of Christ, just like Rahab, we can receive grace. You know, the beautiful thing about this is this is very unusual, particularly from ancient cultures. Did you know that Rahab was listed in the ancestry of Jesus? Did you know that? Did you know it's very unusual, first of all, even to mention they didn't do this, uh, women in genealogies, but she was mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew in the lineage of Jesus. She's mentioned in the book of Hebrews as a person of great faith. Now, the interesting thing is this. You, too, can have your future, your destruction changed by your faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? And so God wants us to focus our life around the gospel. And here's the last thing, and we're done. It's the principle of firsts. I've got to practice the principle of firsts. Now, in the Bible, um, the things that are first are God's. To the Jewish people, the firstborn was to be dedicated to God. Listen to verse 19. All the silver and gold and the things made from bronze and iron belong to the Lord and must be saved for him. Now, why did, he sue, why did he do this? Well, because this was the first city. It was the first city in their conquest of the promised land. And so God said, I want to continue that the first things belong to me. The first day of the week, we worship God. The Bible talks about the tithe. You know what the tithe is? A lot of people say, yeah, it means a tenth. No, it doesn't. It means the first tenth. God wants you to worship him because he wants to be first in your finances. You read the book of Psalms. It talks about praying early in the morning. What is the principle there? Well, I believe we're to give the first part of our day to God. I can just tell you this. You want to begin to practice the principle of first. Give God the first day of the week. Go to church. Worship God. Give God the first part of your finances. Put him first in your money. Worship God. Give him the first part of your day. I realize that for many people, you're not a morning person. I get that. But I think the principle is still important. You got to give God the first part of your life. The first part of your day. The first part of your finances. And when you do, you're honoring God. The principle of firsts. When I give God first, it means that I'm worshiping him. And then we conclude with this, Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, no one can defeat us. You want to be undefeated? You want to be undefeated in spiritual warfare? Well, don't depend on your strength. Don't fight your way because your way is going to lose. Fight God's way. Put him first, and when you do, I promise you, God will bless your life, and you'll begin to win the battle God's way. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.